We just got uh, the first excerpt of Donald Trump's first television interview that he granted to Leslie Stahl of 60 Minutes. Watch this. Shoot. Let me ask you about Obamacare, uh, which you say you're going to repeal and replace. When you replace it, are you going to make sure that people with preconditions are still covered? Yes, because it happens to be one of the strongest assets. You're going to keep that. Also, with the children living with their parents for an extended period, we're going to. You're going to keep very that. much try and keep that. Adds cost, but it's very much something we're going to try and keep. And there's going to be a period, if you repeal it and before you replace it, when millions of people no, could lose. We're them. going to do it simultaneously. It'll be just fine. That's what I do. I do a good job. You know, I mean, I know how to do this stuff. We're going to repeal it and replace it. And we're not going to have like a two day period and we're not going to have a, a two year period where there's nothing. It will be repealed and replaced and we'll know. And it'll be great health care for much less money. Now, you, you heard, Jackie, uh, the, uh, the president-elect uh, say he likes some parts of Obamacare, similarly to what he said in the Wall Street Journal, but he still wants to go on and repeal and replace and create a much better, cheaper system. Okay. What's that going to be? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it going to be what the House Republicans have presented? Is it going to be something else entirely? We don't know because Donald Trump hasn't really given us any specifics over the course of this campaign. It's been a lot of rhetoric, not a lot of uh, details. So we sort of have to wait and see. But you imagine if he's working with someone like Paul Ryan, uh, maybe some of the stuff that the House Republicans have um, you know, put forward um, will, be, will be what he ultimately embraces. Tonight, the residence of the president-elect, Trump Tower, is a fortress ringed by tight security, the center of an increasingly worrisome question. How do you secure a 58-story skyscraper smack in the center of one of the world's busiest cities? It's a question made even more difficult by the fact the building's atrium is a public space, increasingly difficult to monitor, law enforcement officials say. And the building itself, a target as recently as this year of a suction cup climber, seen as potentially vulnerable to any number of threats from surrounding towers and streets. Because it is so dense, you know, the, the damage it could cause is, is potentially immense. So they are, it's going to be, they're, they're going to have their work cut out for them here for quite some time. The FAA already moving to protect it from the air issuing temporary flight restrictions that extend nearly 3,000 feet up and two nautical miles out. In the wake of election night, new cement barriers and sand-filled dump trucks line busy Fifth Avenue, pushing cars and the public further away. Now, a Secret Service presence throughout the building and a regular presence of more than 100 NYPD officers surrounding the property. A debate between Secret Service and NYPD officials still ongoing over even more restrictive actions to take. Concerns exacerbated by the now constant presence of protesters, a group now given their own pin right across the street from the building's main entrance. There always is a possibility, as we've seen in some of these other demonstrations where violence has occurred, where you may have a rogue person or two or a professional agitator or two who may decide that they have to take it a, a notch up or two and then law enforcement is going to have to deal with that on top of the actual securing of, of the perimeter itself. Law enforcement officials acknowledge the challenge. There's no easy way to protect a building that reads Trump Tower and sits right in the middle of Fifth Avenue. Just days after the election, a shakeup inside the Trump transition team. Vice President-elect Mike Pence has taken over Trump's transition efforts, bumping New Jersey Governor Chris Christie down to vice chairman, along with Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, retired Lieutenant General Mike Flynn, Newt Gingrich, and Dr. Ben Carson. Sources say the move comes after infighting inside the transition over whether the team should hire previously anti-Trump Republicans, the so-called never-Trumpers, not to mention the still unfolding Bridgegate scandal in New Jersey. Mr. President, it was a great honor being with you. Another surprise for the new administration comes one day after Donald Trump met with President Obama. Following his conversation with the president, Trump is now open to keeping some portions of Obamacare, something he vowed to repeal during the campaign. Trump told the Wall Street Journal either Obamacare will be amended or repealed and replaced. But the incoming administration is facing a more pressing concern, the continued protests against the president-elect flaring up across the country. Look, I think everyone needs to just take a deep breath.
RNC chair Ryan's Priebus urged calm after the president-elect himself ratcheted up the tensions, returning to Twitter to complain. Just had a very open and successful presidential election. Now professional protesters incited by the media are protesting. Very unfair. A gripe he walked back, later tweeting, Love the fact that the small groups of protesters last night have passion for our great country. We will all come together and be proud. But Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid says Trump must do more than just tweet. If this is going to be a time of healing, Reid says in a statement, we must first put the responsibility for healing where it belongs, at the feet of Donald Trump, a sexual predator who lost the popular vote and fueled his campaign with bigotry and hate. Priebus, who helped persuade Trump to stop tweeting at the end of the campaign and now a frontrunner for White House Chief of Staff, agreed demonstrators have a right to protest. I understand the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, but this election's over now, and we have a president-elect who has done everything he can do over the last 48 hours to say, let's bring people together. CNN has learned Priebus and former campaign chairman Stephen Bannon are the leading candidates for the powerful chief of staff position, with a source telling CNN that signs are pointing to Priebus. And key staffing positions may be coming soon, though House Financial Services chairman Jeb Henserling, who's under consideration for Treasury Secretary, says he's still waiting to talk to Trump officials. I'm very excited about Donald Trump's uh, economic agenda for America, fundamental tax reform, getting rid of bank bailouts, getting rid of Dodd-Frank, having better competitive uh, trade deals. What's up, what's up, what's up? Just giving advice. Trump advisor and former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani now helping to lead Trump's transition team. Donald's been my friend for 28 years. All of my uh, work on behalf of him has been out of great loyalty and friendship to him. I can see already how he is going to be a great president, and I'm glad I could play a small role. Before the election, dozens of GOP national security officials and experts declared in two separate letters that they would never work for a Trump administration. But sources tell CNN that many of those so-called never-Trumpers are coming back, even offering mea culpas. Still, Trump's innermost national security circle will be led by advisors who gave him early and unwavering support. The next president of the United States, Donald Trump. Giuliani, possible for secretary of state, chief of staff, and telling CNN on Thursday, attorney general. I certainly have the energy and there's probably nobody that knows the Justice Department better than me. Senator Jeff Sessions. Donald, welcome to my hometown, Mobile, Alabama. A transition team leader and one of the first GOP senators to back Trump is also likely to land a plum job, including possibly Secretary of Defense. Donald J. Trump to be the next president of the United States. Retired General Michael Flynn offered Trump vociferous support and Hillary Clinton vociferous criticism throughout the campaign including tweeting just one week before the election, quote, you decide NYPD blows whistle on new Hillary emails, money laundering, sex crimes with children, etc. Must read. Allegations that remain unsubstantiated. He is a possibility for senior posts, including national security advisor. His new national security postings will send the world revealing signals about his new foreign policy. Earlier this year, Trump said that he wasn't looking for people with the usual backgrounds. I also look and have to look for talented experts with approaches and practical ideas rather than surrounding myself with those who have perfect resumes. Build a great wall. The wall just got 10 feet higher. Maybe someday they're going to call it the Trump wall. The border between the United States and Mexico stretches nearly 2,000 miles. Nearly 700 miles of it is already covered with some form of border wall or steel fencing. But Donald Trump wants more. On day one, we will begin working on an impenetrable, physical, tall, powerful, beautiful southern border wall. Well, of course it can be done. Professor Michael Deere is an expert in city and regional planning and the author of the book Why Walls Don't Work. A large concrete structure, which might be 25 feet high, um, which should be very intensive in terms of resources and, and money. In fact, CNN has surveyed a number of civil engineers, architects and academics about what may be most feasible. 
The wall would most likely need to be made of precast cement wall panels, 25 feet tall, 10 feet wide, 8 inches thick, requiring 339 million cubic feet of concrete. The panels would be held together by 5 billion pounds of reinforced steel, with an estimated cost of at least $10.5 billion and possibly much more. Trump supporters say they can't wait to see the beginning of the border wall construction. That wall will get built, and Mexico is going to pay for that wall. I think he'll try to build a wall, and I think he'll try to secure our borders. If people want to come into the country, they should do it legally. But in Mexico, the idea of a wall is often shrugged off as a bump in the road north. Jose Torres Hernandez says he's illegally crossed into the U.S. many times to find work picking fruits and vegetables. He says a wall might make crossing over a little harder, but immigrants like him would always find a way to find work to feed their families. And Armando Flores Gutierrez says he's crossed the border 25 times, starting when he was just 16, to work farm fields all over the U.S. He says keeping people like him out of the country will only hurt the U.S. He says if he tries to remove all of the Mexicans in the United States, Donald Trump will realize uh, what a huge mistake that is and how much the U.S. economy depends on Mexican immigrants. Tonight, there is one question above all inside a decimated Democratic Party. Who's to blame? There may be more than enough to go around for one of the biggest defeats in political memory. In calls with donors and supporters, CNN has learned Clinton campaign chair John Podesta says FBI Director James Comey's reviving the email controversy cost Hillary Clinton the election by turning away some of her wavering supporters. Some allies agree. Uh, I was in Clinton headquarters just a few days before the election, uh, and uh, we were looking at data uh, that was very favorable. Uh, the, um, the Comey announcement uh, had kind of turned that data uh, in a different direction. Yet others believe the blame begins with Clinton and her campaign. Jane Sanders at her husband's side during the long Democratic primary fight with Clinton, not mincing words today with Wolf. People are hungry for a new direction. I think that's why Trump has won this election. They want change. As a new political order falls over Washington, Democrats are looking back before they can look forward. Two central questions. Why did college-educated voters turn away from Clinton at the end? And why did working-class voters, even Democrats long friendly to the Clintons, go another way? In the end, they were scared. They cared about their job. They're tired of the status quo. And they voted to shake it up and to have someone who understood that they were scared and was going to care about them. CNN has learned there is also considerable second-guessing about not paying closer attention to Bill Clinton's advice to spend more time focusing on disaffected white working-class voters who were the lifeblood of his campaigns. Now, for the first time in a generation, the Democratic Party is moving forward without a Clinton in the mix. Today, an early scramble to lead the Democratic National Committee. Minnesota Congressman Keith Ellison... Labor Secretary Tom Perez, and former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley, among the early names eyeing bids. Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Chuck Schumer throwing their support behind Ellison, a Muslim and leading liberal who could be the face of the opposition to Donald Trump. It was Ellison, more than a year ago, who suggested on a Sunday talk show President Trump was a possibility. Anybody uh, well, from the Democratic side of the fence who, who uh, thinks that, who's, who's terrified of the possibility of, of, of President Trump, better vote, better get active, better get involved, because this man has got some uh, momentum, and uh, we better be ready. It's one of the most stunning upsets in American political history. The polls were wrong. Political veterans who had previously run successful campaigns were wrong. Pundits were wrong. But... As viewers of the lead may know, one person has been predicting all along that Donald Trump will be the 45th American president. Let's bring in that person, cartoonist, Dilbert creator, Scott Adams. Welcome back to the show, Scott. Thanks, Jake. So you predicted about a year ago that Trump would win because, in your view, he's a, quote, master persuader. Why do you think his persuasion skills were more effective? Well, one of the things he does, and this is, comes from my uh, background as a trained hypnotist and someone who's uh, s studied persuasion for years, is that he speaks in visual ways quite often. That's just one of the things he does. Uh, so if you look at his, uh, his immigration plan, he talks about a wall. 
you know, something you visualize. When he, when he was answering questions about his comments about women, he mentioned Rosie O'Donnell, because you immediately go to that visual image and it takes you off the questions. When he talks about ISIS, he says, they're putting people in cages and they're chopping off heads. So when he talks about his enthusiasm for his campaign, he says, look at the crowds, look how big the crowds are. So he always goes for the visual and our visual sense is our most persuasive uh, part of our brain. Now that he's been elected, which Trump do you think will, will show up to do the job at the White House, the, the diplomatic presidential Trump that we saw okay. yesterday speaking to President Obama, or the one who waged a false campaign suggesting that the first African-American president was born in Africa? Which Donald Trump are the American <laughs> people going to get? Uh, well, I think the good news is that the office of the presidency is really powerful, and it's going to control the person in it for the most part. And the people are watching through social media and everything else, so there's that, that influence over him. But I think you'll see in Trump uh, what I call A-B testing. That's a phrase from the business world where somebody will try something, and then if it doesn't work out, they quickly reverse. You've seen that with his immigration plan. It started out pretty extreme, but with the public's uh, opinion weighing in, that backed off to something that's pretty close to what the current policy is. You saw when he uh, misspoke about uh, abortion and had a, a, about his opinion about punishing women who got illegal abortions, it took all of 24 hours for the public to say, that opinion doesn't work for us, and he immediately changed. So you, you see it again in Obamacare. You see the public saying, yeah, we like you emotionally. We like what you're saying about getting rid of the bad parts, but now he's free to they say, well, some of the good parts we're going to keep. So I think you're going to see a business approach where he rapidly tests a lot of stuff and he's going to keep the good stuff and get rid of the bad stuff. He'll probably do it pretty quickly. One, one last thing before you go, Scott, is I just want to ask uh, you, um, because you've been a, a Trumpologist and also um, seem in, in many times, many instances, to have supported Donald Trump, you, you have experienced something of, of a backlash, um, even when it comes to speaking engagements, is that right? Yeah, so my speaking engagements dried up since I started talking about uh, Trump. They, they went to z uh, zero. That's how many, t how many I have on the books right now. Uh, but people also came to Amazon and gave me one-star reviews on my book and, and said it's because of Trump. Uh, and people said they were calling newspapers to get Dilbert kicked out of newspapers, and that sort of thing. And now when I go out to try to give funding for my startup. I don't know how hard that's going to be, so my timing might be bad there. But overall, I, uh, it was also the most fun year I've ever had in my life, and uh, totally worth it. And if I could be part of um, you know, letting the public see their options a little more clearly, that's good. And I would say uh, on Veterans Day, if anybody wants to find a way to meet in the middle, donate to a, a veterans organization. It's the one thing everybody agrees on. And it's about time to uh, look for some common ground now. A great message at the end there, there. Scott, thanks so much. Good to see you as always. We'll talk to you soon. Right. Thanks, Jake.